the speakers, but also the timeliness of the event. And um, I don't think there's any point in stressing that this is probably one of the toughest challenges that the Trump administration has faced. Um, we put this uh, meeting together rather quickly. Um, is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, we would have loved to have some Iranians here, of course, to present their point of view, but um, it was difficult to make those arrangements in a week. But I think we have two highly qualified um, observers of this issue. Work the, the issue both inside and outside government uh, for over 30 years now. And um, I would just sort of add that I think what makes this particular Iran crisis um, of particular interest is that while George W. Bush um, did not manage to get a huge coalition together like his father, he did have support from really very important key allies, particularly Britain. Now I have the sort of feeling that with the chaos in, in, in London where they have no prime minister and they're not likely to have one in the next sort of three or four weeks or months, uh, where France is in disarray and Mrs. Merkel is not well, uh, it, it, and Germany and France still support very strongly the JCPA. I, I don't know where we're going to get support for any military action except from perhaps some of the Gulf states and Israel. But that's just my point of view. Now, what we really want to hear is the point of view of Ken Hollock and Paul Pillar. I think you know them both very well, so I will not uh, beladen you with their extraordinary resumes. Um, just to say that both have worked um, in and out of government. Um, both have worked for the CIA. Um, Ken did two stints on the National Security Council. Paul was the, uh, the, um, the uh, chief um, intelligence officer for the Middle East at the agency and um, was a reserve officer in the US Army and actually served uh, duty in, in Vietnam. So they, they've got impeccable credentials. Um, what I asked them, them to do was for Ken to start off by talking a little bit about the broad geopolitical picture and trying as, as well as he can to uh, make some guesses about where, where the Iranians are coming from at this point since they are under enormous pressure and then uh, have Paul put his unique sort of bureaucratic uh, stamp on where this sort of stands within the US government and the extent to which the extraordinary events of the last 48 hours within the White House uh, are representative of a new form of Trumpism or whether this is uh, something that was one off. So without further ado, I'll ask them both to speak for about 15 minutes. We'll then open up for questions. We have around the table some true other experts on Iran who I will hopefully call upon uh, to talk. All I ask that you do is that you announce, you wait for the microphone to come to you, you speak into the microphone, and you announce who you are and who you're affiliated with. So without any further ado, um, again, thank you all for coming. And Ken, it's yours. Thank you very much, Jeff. Can everyone hear me? Standing. OK, uh, so yes, as you heard Jeff say, uh, Jeff and George asked me to kind of put on my hat as an old Iran analyst and try to make sense of what the Iranians are doing. Uh, it's a situation I, like, I leapt at the opportunity because, of course, it's so much easier 
right now to figure out the Iranian side than it is to figure out the American side. <laughs> All that said, and if there is a tremendous amount of Iran expertise around the table, as all of you know, as those of you who don't follow Iran on, on a regular basis probably suspect, we need to be careful. And so I'm going to give you my sense of where I think the Iranians are and how they're approaching this. None of us knows for sure. All of this is ultimately played out within very closed circles inside Iran among peoples who, people who really don't speak very much, who really rarely give their private thoughts public voice. And of greatest importance, in many cases, it's really all about the mind of one man, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, and none of us has the ability to look inside his mind. So we have to be very careful about this. With that caveat in mind, I'm glad to give you my perspective on how Iran is approaching this, but please do understand it's my perspective on them. Uh, it is not revealed truth. It is not based on any documents or uh, any other, you know, perfect insight into what they're believing. With that said, what I really wanted to focus on here was how Trump's approach to the Iran problem, I think, has made his strategy self-defeating. I think that's the most important thing, at least that I take away from all of this, and I want to unpack that. And I need to go back a little bit and do a little bit of history with you, but I promise to make it brief. And for me, it has to start with 2015 and the signature of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, the Iranian nuclear. <coughs> and as again, many of you know, at that time, as there always is, there was a debate in Iran. I'm going to simplify because we don't have time to unpack all the differences in Iran. And I'm going to simply say that there were two different camps, camps which more or less exist today, a group which I will call the pragmatists, because nobody likes to say the moderates anymore. So the group I will call the pragmatists, led by President Rouhani and his foreign minister, Javad Zarif. Their argument was in favor of the JCPOA, and their argument, their strategy broadly conceived, was Iran's greatest problems are economic. That is the great unhappiness of the Iranian people. It is the great threat to the legitimacy of the regime. By signing the JCPOA, we will have the sanctions lifted. That will make the economy much better. That will make our people happier will allow this regime to continue on in office. I think there was a lot more to their position. I am greatly caricaturing it, but I think that that is more or less how they approached the JCPOA and how they tried to sell it to the rest of Iran, certainly to the Iranian leadership. They, of course, were opposed by a group of hardliners. Uh, that group of hardliners consists of a whole variety of different people, many of them associated with the leadership of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. What's important about the hardline position is their counter-argument. Their counter-argument, the JCPO was very consistently, look, the Iranian people don't care about the economy, they care much more about their revolutionary ideology, their power, etc. They're willing to live without. It's always part of it. Honestly, I'm not even sure the, Iranian, the hardline leadership actually believed that, but you did hear it from time to time. Of much greater importance, though, the arguments that they made were, look, this agreement is not going to be worth the paper that it's written on. The Americans will never honor it. They will never lift all of the sanctions because they want to destroy the Islamic Republic. They, Even if they sign it, they will cheat, they will renege on it, and eventually they will walk away from it, leaving us stuck with it. That's a very important argument because, of course, what the Iranians believe that they have seen since then is the pragmatist's argument completely disproven and the hardliner's argument completely proven. The United States didn't completely lift the sanctions, right? There are a whole bunch of reasons why, and we even warned them that we weren't going to be able to lift all of the sanctions. Of greater importance, the Iranian people didn't see the boost in their economy that Rouhani and Zarif were promising them, where they believed that they were promised by Zarif and Rouhani. And then along comes Trump, right? He tears up the agreement, walks away, slaps new sanctions on Iran. And the Iranians are still bound by its terms, right? And for the first year and a half or so of Trump's administration, 
they are forced to go along with it, even though the hardliners are saying, we told you so, we've got to walk away from this. As a result, what we've also seen in Tehran, I would argue, is an advantage shifting ever more toward the hardliners. Uh, you know, again, we can argue about the supreme leader and where he ultimately sits. My own feeling, my own sentiment is that he's tried to always be the pivot point of Iranian politics, typically trying to satisfy both the hardliners and the pragmatists and all their many different incarnations over the years but that he personally has inclined ever more steadily towards the hardliners. A uh, significant change from the days when Jeff was over at the White House and Khamenei was the great reformist, uh, great uh, moderate in Iran. He has moved very dramatically away from that over the course of time. But I think that in particular, he has moved away from that in the last few years. And you know, we've seen most remarkably Khamenei very publicly excoriating Rouhani for the JCPOA, saying, I didn't trust this agreement. I thought you were wrong to sign it, right? All of this predicated on his own belief that you cannot trust the United States of America, that the United States will always renege on things. And I think that's very important because, of course, I do believe that Trump's goal is to get a better JCPOA. Now, one other piece I probably should have mentioned, I applied it, but I should probably make it, uh, make it explicit. The last piece of the hardline critique of the JCPOA <coughs> was that it was too good a deal for the Americans and too bad a deal for the two Trump comes to them, says, I'm tearing up the deal, exactly what the hardliners predicted, and now he is demanding a deal that is even better for the United States of America. Now, again, we can all disagree with the Iranian perceptions. We can all say Iran got more than they deserve. The U.S. could have gotten a better deal. Right? That's not my point right now. My point right now is that's not the Iranian perception. It is certainly not the perception of Iran's hardliners, and I don't think it's the perception of Ayatollah Khamenei. Right? So going into this, the whole idea that Trump was going to get to rip up the JCPOA and have the Iranians come back to the table and negotiate a new one that was better for the U.S., worse for Iran, was always going to be a very steep mountain to climb, right? And the mere fact that he did tear up the deal, walk away <coughs> from it, simply reinforced the arguments of the hardliners, and I think also reinforced their domestic position. And again, that's what I see playing out. Right? Rouhani and Zarif are very much on the defensive, and we've seen that for the last year, year and a half. Right? And what's more, just look at the events of the last few weeks. The attacks on the tankers, the attacks on the Saudi pumping stations, on the oil facilities, the, you know, the rocket attacks in Iraq and into Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, right? the drone shoot down. <coughs> I don't know what role Hassan Rouhani and Javad Zarif played in any of those decisions. But what I feel safe in saying is that none of those decisions accorded with the original strategy that they <coughs> laid out for how to handle the United States of America. They may very well be going along with it. They may feel like they have to do so either for their own domestic political uh, survival or because they also feel badly burned in the United States. I don't know. I actually don't know what Rouhani and Zarif can say. All I can say is that it is very clear that this runs directly contrary to the policy that they were laying out. And to my mind, again, that supports my contention that it is the hardliners, the guard, and others who are very much in the driver's seat when it comes to Iran's foreign policy right now. Okay, again, what does that mean? It means that they're highly unlikely to strike the deal that Trump is determined to get. Right? What he keeps saying he wants, his actions keep making it less and less likely that he's actually going to get it because he's playing the domestic <coughs> politics of Iran completely wrong. And by the way, I say that as someone who has also consistently warned that the United States shouldn't try to play Iran's domestic politics, they always get it wrong, right? Which I will defend, I think is a fair statement. But I'll simply say we're getting it wronger than we usually do. And we're playing it even worse than we normally do. The present crisis. And here I'm gonna wrap up. I don't know what the Iranians make of what the United States has been doing over the last few weeks. Uh, it's bewildering. 
right? I'm going to be interested to hear what Paul thinks we've been up to over the last few weeks. I have my pet theory. I talked to good friends who, you know, have had as much experience in government in Washington as I have. We all have very gifts simply making one mistake after another, regardless of which side of U.S. policy you may be, whether you're hawk, dove, what you think about Iranian policy. But again, we, I, I ask the question of how does this play into Iran? Certainly Trump's many statements over the last few days, I look at and think they're, again, not going to be helpful in terms of a lot of domestic politics. If Trump's goal is to somehow convince the Iranian leadership that it would be best for them and it is possible for them to come back to the negotiating table, right, Shep and Ayatollah Khamenei, that he wants to destroy them, that the United States is seeking their destruction. I am afraid that his then uh, sudden reversal and insistence that he doesn't want a war, which I tend to ascribe mostly to the domestic political criticism that he was taking, right, even from the right and from his own base who didn't want a war with Iran, when he has to then go out and say, I don't want a war, I don't want a war, I suspect that the Iranians may very well have looked at that, particularly the hardliners, and said, aha, he wants to bring us down, but he's not willing to risk a war with us, right? That gives us leverage. And again, I suspect that the president understood that he was handing that leverage over to the Iranians. Um, and that's why he threatened uh, military action against them, in particular in response to the drone shootout. Right? Um, which, you know, on there, I am convinced that that was all a bluff. I am quite convinced that he never intended to do that. Um, I'm glad to explain to you my reasoning if you want to hear about it, but that's a separate <clears throat> issue. All I think this matters to the Iranians is he announces that he's not going to strike and that the risk of 150 Iranian casualties was enough to deter him, which again, I suspect, once again, reinforces that hardline conviction that this is a president who doesn't have the strong policy. Right? We can afford to confront the United States. Trump doesn't have the stomach for a fight with us. He's desperate for a deal, right? and he's not going to take forceful action against us if we continue to do what we're doing. And, you know, let's recognize here, um, I've probably given what sounds like a very dovish perspective <clears> the <throat> whole crisis, but let's point out that the Iranians have, made, have mounted repeated attacks on U.S. facilities and U.S. allies over the last few weeks, and they've suffered no consequences. Right? The one I don't know about is this cyber attack that Trump apparently launched. Um, again, I know only what I read in the newspapers. I don't know how damaging that actually was. And I also don't know how the Iranians read it. Do they read it as something painful that really was a deterrent for them, as if we continue to push on the United States, if we continue to mount these attacks, we'll suffer more attacks like that. We don't want that to happen. Or do we read it as, again, Trump clearly doesn't have a stomach for spilling blood. And the cyber attack he mounted on us doesn't really bother us. And if that's the best he's got, we can put, keep pushing down this road. I don't ultimately know. None of us does. But again, I, I end where I started. Trump's actions seem to have placed Iran's hardliners more firmly in control of Iranian foreign policy. And the tendency has been to seek confrontation with the United States, to underplay the willingness of U.S. governments to use force, in some cases to court the U.S. Uh, a, a conflict with the United States, which we've seen on a number of occasions. And I fear that Trump's actions have simply convinced them that Trump doesn't have that stomach, that they can do whatever they like. And I fear also that this will cause them to at some point overstep. Because I do think that somewhere Donald Trump does have red lines. I think that they move. I think that they're unpredictable. I don't think that he knows what they are until he suddenly decides that someone has crossed them. But I fear that at some point, if the Iranians do keep pushing, they will cross that red line. And then we'll get some kind of a conflict. And from my perspective, the worst thing about that would be, I don't think it would serve anyone's strategic interest. <laughs> okay. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. Um, Ken? Okay, th thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to fulfill uh, Jeff's uh, promised mission of explaining what's happening on the U.S. end. As, as Ken correctly said, uh, 
that's a lot harder to figure out than on the Iranian end. My, my comments are going to be on two things. One, you know, how we got into the current crisis, and two, some of the dynamics that are playing out and what this means in terms of how we might get out of the crisis. And of those two things, the first one is much easier to describe. Uh, a little over a year ago, the Trump administration completely reneged on U.S. obligations under the JCPOA, uh, launched uh, full blast a, an economic warfare campaign intended to cripple the, economic, the economy of Iran to make life as miserable as they could for Iranians, and coupled that with saber rattling and military threats and deployments uh, in the Gulf and so on. Uh, when Secretary of State Pompeo made a statement after the most recent uh, tanker sabotage, uh, there were a number of things that one can question about his statement, including various attacks that he attributed to Iran that Iran probably didn't have anything to do with. But what I found the most questionable was his repeated use of the term unprovoked. Uh, if you take what, uh, what the current administration has been dishing out to Iran, uh, for a year, I, and that's not provocation, I'm not sure what is. And of course, the other side of this is that the administration has not given Iran any out, you know, any sort of positive, constructive way to, uh, to get out of this situation. Instead, we have Pompeo's list of 12 demands, which, if it's to be interpreted as anything more than maximalist rhetoric, essentially would amount to Iran rolling over and being a supine entity that sort of does what we tell them to do. If it were to go any further and we got to a 13th demand, my expectation it might be it'd be something like the Supreme Leader getting on state television and singing the Star Spangled Banner. But now I mean, we have to remember what would, what would happen, even though we always have to be careful about alternative histories, even recent ones, uh, if that had not been uh, the policy of the administration and if the um, the Rouhani Zarif faction that, that Ken described was still the dominant player in terms of Iranian diplomacy. Well, I think you see, number one, if the U.S. was still adhering to the terms of the JCPOA, so would Iran, since it had been doing so as repeatedly certified by the IAEA, and indeed continue to do so even a year after the U.S. renamed. Uh, it would not have any particular incentive, at least you know, the, the, what would be still then the, the dominant strain of decision making in Tehran to seek out military confrontation with the United States, you know, you know on, a, on a dimension in which the Iranians are vastly inferior. And if the uh, Iranians still had their own oil export trade, they would uh, not have an incentive to uh, take the very high risks of sabotaging, you know, somebody else's tankers. It never was realistic that, you know, Iran would just sit there and take what was being dished out to them. They're really trying to outweigh Trump. Uh, their, their main hope is for regime change here in Washington come January 2021. Uh, and meanwhile, they were hoping that the Europeans would stitch together enough kind of economic recompense with their special vehicle now called Instex and other devices that they would get some of the economic benefit that was promised to them in the JCPOA. Regardless of whether either of these hopes uh, ever would materialize, uh, they quite legitimately regarded themselves as the ones who have exercised uh, a lot of patience and restraint over this past year. But no one's patience is unlimited. And I think why it's visibly given out just over this last month is two things. One, uh, the latest economic escalatory steps by the Trump administration, namely the removal of what had been waivers uh, for uh, sanctions for purchases of uh, Iranian oil by some of the principal purchasers. Uh, and secondly, um, the, uh, the, uh, the saber rattling um, uh, and, and the military confrontation in the Gulf. And I would add to that, it's very important, the disappointment that the, the INSTEC device that the Europeans are trying to put together has basically so far not come to, to anything of any consequence, mainly because European governments cannot you know, command their private sector to uh, withstand uh, or to overcome their fear of the long reach of the U.S. Treasury. Now, some of what the Iranians have done recently has been unsurprising you know, defensive moves. Um, things like you know, missiles on Dow's, uh, they get talked about uh, without the further analysis that, well, I would be surprised if the Iranians were not taking some measures. 
uh, in anticipation of what they might do to try to strike back if indeed they were the target of a U.S. military strike. It's classical security dilemma type stuff. And to the extent what we could say are more tactically offensive measures have been taken, and I'm talking about things like the tanker sabotage, assuming Iran did it, the objectives have been to uh, send a message to the Europeans and to the Russians and Chinese and the rest of the international community to try to energize them to do something about uh, the course that the Trump administration is on to try to back off from this current crisis. A message to Trump himself and those in his administration and others here in, in, in U.S. politics uh, that Iran can inflict some hurt back uh, in return and a message to their own domestic constituencies uh, and anyone else who's watching from overseas that Iran is not just going to sit there and take it uh, indefinitely. I mean, more strategically, the Iranian responses have been very consistent with the history of the Islamic Republic of countering pressure with pressure and of not just sitting down and doing transactions if they perceive themselves to be in a position of weakness that they haven't done everything they can to try to correct, first of all. The U.S. Uh, is the one that abandoned diplomacy when they walked out of the uh, JCPOA. And when I say diplomacy, I'm including you know, in the foreign ministry channel that had been established as part of those negotiations, and which, by the way, was useful, you know, a couple of years back during the Obama administration, a previous time when we had U.S. military assets that strayed into Iranian territory. You remember that. Uh, and it was defused rather quickly with the uh, phone calls between Zarif and John Kerry. Um, and also the, the diplomacy that's represented by the Joint Commission uh, set up by the uh, by the JCPOA in which any disagreements or issues about compliance get thoroughly hashed out among all the parties. Um, since then, Iran's recent actions, I think, have been measured in a way that has been intended to leave open a path of returning to diplomacy. On the tanker attacks, it's been noted, and I agree, that you know the limpet mines were put above the waterline, not below. They apparently were not intended to sink the ships. And now with the uh, shoot down of the drone, the Iranians have been making a big deal out of the fact that there was a PA, a, a manned uh, U.S. Navy aircraft in the same area, and they're saying, we could have shot that down and incurred human casualties, but they didn't. The Iranians would notice. Without such, oh, there are other, all kinds of other signs that, that the, the Iranians would be looking for. Um, you know, dumping Bolton obviously would be a, a very positive sign from their point of view. Uh, without such signs, Iran could be expected to continue to take calibrated, measured steps to exceed the JCPOA limits even more than what they've already threatened to do. And this could include, and this is really going to cause a stir in this town when this happens, not just size of low enriched uranium stockpiles, but enriching to a higher level than the three point whatever percent it is that defines the low enriched uranium. I would expect to see that if, if we don't see a backing away from the current crisis and it, the, the crisis continues. Um, the JCPOA, and I, I have to agree with, with Ken on this, you know, it reflected as much as could have been wrung out of Iran at the time we had these international sanctions. Uh, it was a very long, difficult negotiation, uh, punctuated by shouting matches between uh, Zarif and John Kerry. And that was when we had this international support. Now it's the United States that is more isolated and less able to muster the international support, not only for the reasons Jeff mentioned in terms of the internal turmoil in European countries, but simply because of the substance of what's taking place and what everyone's awareness of who it was who did not uh, live up to their commitments under the previous agreement. I might, in fairness though, uh, offset that by noting that one thing the, the administration may still have going for is the tendency of people to focus, you know, very narrowly on the here and now, you know, who, who's the last one who shot down an aircraft, that sort of thing, while forgetting uh, how we got into all this in the first place. Vladimir Putin, uh, a couple of weeks back, uh, publicly you know, urged the Iranians to maintain uh, their observance of the JCPOA limits, and he did so by way of warning the Iranians that you know, if you violate the, the limits, people are going to forget that it was the U.S. that was the first one that did a big violation. They're just going to focus on what you did more recently. And I think Putin uh, may be right about that. 
It is clearly on the U.S. side where the main story will be and the main movement will have to be, given that it was because of the U.S. policy, as I mentioned at the outset, that we got to where we are today. The Trump administration took this path basically for two reasons. One, because the main agreement involved, the JCPOA, was Obama's agreement. And that was seen as reason enough to oppose it and try to destroy it. And the other reason was, as Fareed Zakaria put it in a recent column the other day, that this administration has subcontracted its Middle East policy to Israel and Saudi Arabia. And to that, I think you can add the UAE. And the subcontractors have their own reasons to want to see Iran perpetually uh, isolated, ostracized, sanctioned, weakened, and loathed. And there, from the president's point of view, uh, for Donald Trump, I don't think there was any follow-up thinking at all in terms of where this would lead. Now, when you get to individuals inside the administration, and John Bolton, I'm talking about you, then you could say there was a strategy, and part of the strategy was to intentionally get to a war that you would like. But that's certainly not Donald Trump's posture. He got boxed into this because of being motivated by those other things that I just mentioned with no thought as to how to get out of the box. Now, it's too much to expect that Trump is going to ever admit openly the ways in which maximum pressure has failed, that instead of getting a better deal, instead we're getting the Iranians starting to exceed the limits of the JCPOA itself. And instead of taming Iranian behavior because we're uh, impoverishing them through sanctions, they're doing the things they're doing today in the Persian Gulf. And instead of getting closer to the holy grail of regime change in Tehran in a direction that we Americans would welcome, we have exactly the dynamic that Ken mentioned with the hardliners getting the upper hand. But there still are possible steps that if Trump really worked hard to get out of this box, he could take without making that kind of acknowledgement, without making a big reversal of policy above the table. Uh, there could be uh, that quiet easing up on oil sanctions that I mentioned before. But I think the main hope for any of us in getting out of this crisis is Trump's demonstrated tendency in seeking to present himself as the expert deal maker, to present as a great new deal something that may be only a minor modification of what we had before, but he can still describe it as something much, much better than what we had before. And I think the model for this was NAFTA, uh, in which you know, a relatively few modifications of the previous agreement get renamed. And instead of what was described as one of the worst trade deals ever, now we have one of the best trade deals ever. If I had the ear of any Iranian policymaker, and I emphasize I do not, um, I would first of all echo Vladimir Putin's advice about you know, staying within the terms of the JCPOA. I would secondly urge restraint with regard to physical actions in the Persian Gulf. But then I would say, look, if you can somehow overcome your own hangups, in political hangups in Tehran, and all the things we know you want to do, try to establish deterrence and establish an image of strength, exploit this tendency on the part of Trump. Bite your lip hard and be willing to negotiate under conditions where you still don't think you, you know, reestablished your image of strength, and rely on the prospect that Trump will be willing to sign something that is a relatively minor a la NAFTA modification of the JCPOA, and then let him go back and crow how it is so much better and how he won and Iran lost and exercise restraint in not trying to say anything publicly to refute that. That's how you can get some sanctions relief. Uh, which is what you're really aiming for, uh, and this is probably the best hope you have for getting it. We're no doubt going to need some kind of third-party mediation. I mean, the Omanis, of course, previously played a role. Um, uh, the Japanese, the Swiss, or other uh, uh, candidates. Uh, Trump is not going to get a Singapore-style summit. The, the Iranians are going to have to have, through five channels, probably third-party mediated some way of getting over that, that credibility gap uh, as they view the Trump administration and some way of getting a better idea that there is an end to this that is more than just uh, this administration is out to destroy Iran. I want to make one last point with regard to some of the longer term consequences that flow from what uh, Ken described very well in terms of the 
the move toward the hot hardline dominance inside Tehran, and this has to do with with the nuclear issue. Um, the the Iranians have repeatedly demonstrated that, that they are still committed to wanting to get the JCPOA back on track, to having full compliance with it, and that they are committed to the strategic decision that they made some years back that which led to the negotiation of the JCPOA, that they would be better off, that Iran would be better off uh, as a non-nuclear weapon state that is allowed to participate fully in the economic and political international community, rather than as a nuclear weapon state that, that's ostracized and saying. But with all of the US threats, especially military threats, as well as the other economic warfare that's been waged, this has surely strengthened whatever advocacy there still is in Tehran for the proposition that Iran would be better off if they had a nuclear weapon. The Iranians see what happens to other governments, um, just like any other government observes what happens overseas. The North Koreans took very explicit note of what happened to Gaddafi in Libya, and they, and they said openly, we're not going to make the same mistake Gaddafi did, giving up his unconventional weapons programs. And the Iranians surely have looked at how US policy, not just under Trump, but before, uh, have worked toward Libya and toward North Korea. And just yesterday, you know, we hear the North Koreans saying that Kim Jong-un got an excellent letter, their words not our, mine, uh, from, from Donald Trump. And so if there is a voice in Tehran today making the argument that one of the differences between how the U.S is treating North Korea, despite how loathsome that regime is, and we've got love letters being exchanged between Trump and Kim Jong-un, and how they are treating Iran is that North Korea has nukes and Iran doesn't. And the farther this crisis plays out in which the Iranians will, as I mentioned before, incrementally violate more and more, or exceed more and more, I should say, since the U.S. had the violation, uh, the limits of the JCPOA, the more within reach uh, that nuclear weapons path will appear and the more credible that hardline pro-nuke uh, view will sound. And on that happy note. Well, wow. thank you both very much. Uh, a, lot to, a lot of things to think about. And uh, let's just um, see who has their hands up and I will try it well now. Let me start here. Okay, well, this is a good start. So, Jacob, you were first. First. Yes. Hi, I'm Jacob Palmerin, editor of the National Interest. So my question I get is for both, oh, sorry. My question is for both Ken and Paul. I realize that the regime in Iran appears to be under increasing economic duress. However, don't the events of the last couple weeks suggest that the regime is in fact on a roll? and that Trump, far from undermining the regime, has strengthened it, and that it has scant incentive to follow the path that you suggested towards the end of your talk, Paul. Why haven't the hardliners been validated from, as far as I can see, Zarif was in fact wrong. The hardliners were correct, as Paul was, as Ken was saying. The United States willfully abrogated this agreement. Now, Iran is conducting what amounts to pinprick attacks against the United States that have proven successful. They have exposed Trump as what Max Boot is calling a Twitter tiger. <laughs> not a paper tiger. 
So why should why shouldn't Iran simply hold out and continue to exploit the situation rather than trying to reach some kind of modus vivendi with the United States? Well, uh, can I just ask, it, it, hold out for what? I mean, were, were you talking about for a new, my last for, comments for about a new, nuclear? For a new president. Oh, for a new president. Oh. Well, I mean, I, I think the, the main answer to that is, that, you know, the economic distress that Iran is experiencing is severe. There's no question about it. Uh, and that there are a number of reasons having to do with internal management and so on. But these sanctions have hurt a lot. Um, and you know, especially after this most recent round, and I suggested this was a stimulus for some of what we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks, uh, the waiver of these last, um, I'm sorry, the, the repeal of the last waiver of sanctions for some of the big oil importers, that is, um, I don't see how, whether you're a hardliner or a pragmatist in Tehran, you can um, talk with, um, much credibility at all about well we'll just we'll just make it through the next year. Um, it's there's no question about it. They're they they are in an economic pain. I'll add a few points. First, I, Paul's absolutely right that they are in, acad in economic pain. That said, I'm very dubious that they are going to make any kind of a meaningful gesture towards the United States. Um, I think that they are very focused on 2020. Actually, Paul made this point. I completely agree with it. I think their strategy is to wait out this president and see if he can win. Uh, you know, my read of Khamenei over the course of history is this is not a guy who likes to take big, bold steps. He likes to move incrementally. And I think that what's going on now is an incremental shift in the direction of the hardliners, which he's very comfortable with and probably could be induced to make more incremental steps in their direction. I think that moving toward negotiations with the U.S., right now would be a huge step. It's possible. I can't rule it out. I don't see it. You're just you know, a couple of other points. You know, none of us really knows what's going on with the Iranian people. Um, you know, we had some interesting stuff over the weekend written by people talking about it. Uh, you know, what I gathered from that stuff is they're really angry about their situation. They're blaming both the United States and the regime. Right? And historically, you know, what we've seen is that countries under this kind of course of duress, whether it's, you know, Nazi Germany under bombing, or other countries, Iraq for instance, under economic sanctions, there is a tendency to be unhappy with your regime, but also to blame in particular the people inflicting the pain on you. The last point, you know, the thing that, that in theory Trump would be counting on to move these guys is the threat of unrest from the people. As we all know, the Guard benefits from this by and large. Right? Economically, it's actually helpful to them in many different ways. Right? The, the real fear is that the people are going to rise up against them. And my suspicion is that the regime doesn't like to repress the people, but is very comfortable doing it. Right? And going back to 1999, there have been at least five different occasions when they have successfully throttled would-be popular revolutions. And I think that they believe that they can continue to do that at least until our 2020 elections. So yeah, I tend to be of the mindset that I don't think it likely. I mean, I think what Paul recommended makes eminent good sense. I'm guessing that Zarif is probably trying to make some kind of a suggestion like that. I highly doubt anybody in Tehran is listening right now. Okay, thank you very much, sir. You were next. Around here. Thank you, John Duke Anthony, National Council on U.S. Relations. Just out of curiosity, given the uh, restrictions on U.S. government officials uh, spending uh, time on the ground in certain countries, and the extent to which the uh, American officials spent empirical time on the ground in Iraq prior to uh, the U.S. attack uh, against it. Uh, how much time have either of our two speakers spent uh, more than a month traveling around inside Iran and meeting with the Iranian people to try to uh, tap the pulse of Iranian needs, Iranian concerns, Iranian interests, Iranian foreign policy objectives? More than a month? 
I've I'm never been. No, no. Likewise with me. I mean, okay. it, most it, of I think our intelligence it, analysts have it. Right? It's it, why we have to be very careful. <laughs> yes. It, it, right. Are you okay? That. Right. Right. Same as the rock in that regard. And let me say that Ken, unlike <laughs> myself, I mean, has done in-depth research from outside the boundaries of, of uh, Iranian history and, and military affairs. But thank you. Um, your point is well taken. I think there are other people who have been to Iran, mm -hmm. so they can they can they can chime in. Yes. Um, in fact, you, I think one of them is up next, right. Barbara. Thanks. Yeah, I've been there nine times, but, but not recently. It's a little hard to go. Um, uh, Paul, you put forward a, a possible scenario for some kind of progress, but but. I want to go back to the question of the coherence of the Trump administration's policy toward Iran, its various demands, and so on. Do we really know what they want? I mean, if we look at the various demands that have been put forward at various times by different individuals in the administration, it seems that the real goal of this is uh, simply to weaken Iran. It's not to get a new deal, not to get a better deal. It's to weaken Iran, to make the Saudis happy, the Israelis happy, the Emiratis happy. Sheldon Adelson happy. Uh, there is no goal, in which case Iran is really apart from weakening Iran, in which case Iran has no choice but to resist, to hang in there, to try to get people to bust sanctions. So I just wonder if you might agree with that analysis. Thanks. Uh, the short answer is yes in terms of what the dominant thrust of U.S. policy is, but I would quickly couple that with the observation you always have to make on lots of issues with this administration, but certainly with this issue. It depends on who exactly you're talking about in the administration. I think if you go to the level of the president, it doesn't even get as sophisticated as I want to weaken Iran. It, it was all domestic politics. I mean, the anti-Obama stuff obviously is part of that. So it, it's, it's really no different from you know, Obamacare and healthcare. It's, it's basically the same as that. And uh, with regard to the subcontracting on Middle East policy that we've seen so many other indications of, particularly with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian dimension, um, that's basically domestic politics, too. Uh, so if, if, if Mr. Trump sat down and you forced him and you were interviewing him and you said, uh, hey, it, let's get beyond domestic politics and what is the purpose, if he were to be honest at that point, he said, yeah, I, I think we ought to weaken Iran somehow. And, but then once you get beyond that, I, I think you have to get even more complicated. You know, John Bolton is on record as favoring uh, going to arms against Iran. Don't, and far be it for me to explain what the objective of that would be. I mean, all, my best guess is it's sort of the, the, the Jerry Rubin view of grooving on the rubble, you know, and which was, you know, underlaid a lot of the, uh, uh, the momentum to uh, launch the Iraq war. You know. If we stir things up and tear things down that we don't like, whatever emerges from that is is bound to be better than what we've got now. I, I, that's that's my best guess. Isn't it isn't it fair to say that uh, that the real, I mean, the benchmark for American policy has to be Pom, Pompeo's speech, which I call the dead parrot speech because. Um, <laughs> And it is so it's so negative that 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 anything Trump is going to do in, in, in way of in an incentives such as you two both alluded to has to refute the dead parrot speech because that is the gold standard right now. Anyway, that's my view on Pompeo. Jenny Abbott. Uh, thanks so much. Um, my question is more specific, and um, it's about the Revolutionary Guards. And I was wondering if both of you could comment about this, sort of from the Iranian view as well as from the CENTCOM U.S. military view. Because it seems to me that, and I would push back a bit on what both of you have said in terms of Iran's motivations, it seems to me that the Guards have a lot to gain from a military confrontation with the United States. They have a lot to gain economically, politically. I mean, in some ways, Trump has sort of given them a gift domestically, as you mentioned, because the population, we can assume, is now rallying around the regime, even though they were very critical over the last several years. 
But it seems to me that the guards, that this is this kind of response by Iran is not sort of just reactive. It can be, if we think of it in terms of what we know about the history of the guards, the composition of the guards, it can be considered strategic. So if you're the guards and you want a confrontation with the United States for a variety of reasons that we all know about, isn't this the perfect situation? Because you have a drone in the air, you attack a drone, you have ships in the Gulf, you attack the ships, and then nations, there is a status quo in Iran that they're very happy with. Hardliners prevail when Hamenei dies. There's a succession they can live with or they won't. There is a population that's much more anti-American than they had than had been six months ago. So it seems to me that if we look at this from a much more strategic military position on the Iranian side, that the escalation probably will continue. And that's what the guards want. If you're some of these commanders, and they've said as much, even though I'm the first to say that nobody should take what any Iranian official or military person says on face value, but they've, they've applauded the, the attacks. They want the attacks. They've said this very publicly. And from what we know about the institution of the Revolutionary Guards, to me, this totally fits the playbook. Thank you. I'll start following. Um, so I, I apologize if I was being a little coy there, but I more or less agree with you, and I thought that was pretty implicit in my, my comments. And I think that it's true not just in terms of what they believe, what they, I think it also works for them, as you're now applying, domestically, in terms of their own politics and in terms of enabling them to more fully drive Iranian policy, gain control over other Iranian institutions. I think that all works for them. That said, I think that there are two important caveats to that. First. I think Khamenei is probably in a somewhat different position. I think there are probably others around him as well. And in particular, I think that we've seen enough from Khamenei to say that this is a guy who absolutely does not want a major war with the United States of America. I think there's no question about that, that he has tremendous respect for American military capabilities. And while in certain circumstances, like the present one, is glad to try to push to see where our red lines are and try to come up right against them, I don't think he, he means to cross them, because I think he's very concerned about that. And to, to push that a little further, I don't quite know where the guard leadership stands on that issue. Uh, I'm willing to give them credit that they're actually smart enough to understand the same thing. Right, that if they can you know, do minor provocations, if they can take a shot at us every once in a while and then scurry behind mom's skirt, they're glad to do that. But I, again, I tend to think that they're smart enough to understand that if there were ever a real shooting war, they'd lose their toys really quickly, right? And that there would be real repercussions for them in terms of having started it and what that would mean for them in the Iranian system. So again, I think the right, the confrontation works to their advantage in a lot of different ways. I think that they are quite willing to provoke us. Uh, you know, I noted the fact that the president and, and several other folks in the administration suggested that the leadership may not have ordered the shot at the at Reaper, uh, or sorry, at the Global Hawk. Um, that, you know, to me is of a pattern. It's possible, right? And again, it may be that the higher leadership looked at that and said, what the hell did we just do? I don't know, but again, that's, uh, I, I think that's also an important caution that much as it can advantage them, I think it's one of these where, you know, it goes very much in their direction until it reaches that tipping point where they've gone too far and provoked a real war with us. Anything to add? No, I'd, I'd agree with Ken and point out that some of the very things that, that you pointed out in terms of how events have been going their way in terms of uh, killing the nuclear deal or going in that direction, um, and politically seeing the pragmatists who negotiated it uh, being on the decline, um, why would they want to you know, screw up that process when uh, somebody else, namely you know, Donald Trump, is taking care of it for themselves? And I couldn't agree more with what. Uh, about if it came to it, we talk about confrontation, but if confrontation means um, uh, live munitions being fired, as, as Ken put it, they would lose their toys in a real hurry. And, and there's I have no question that the 
you know, the, the targeting priorities uh, in the Pentagon for any kind of military strike has those toys right up at the top. Two, uh, two, two, two finger interventions, and it better be two fingered. Barbara. Yeah, this is a, a tweet that Secretary Treasury Secretary Mnuchin is going to designate Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif later this week. So those who say that this administration is interested in any kind of negotiation should go get their head examined. Tony, you had a Tony, you had a two finger. That was three fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to be very careful about using the term. Can you speak up a little bit, please? I think we need to be very careful about using the term war. What kind of war on earth are you talking about? The, what we have learned a little about is that we were thinking of targeting, as we did in other cases, their air defense is enough to weaken the ability to use precision strike. But when you say that you can hit them well with precision strike, I think there are a number of people in CENTCOM who would be far more careful about the ability to do that than our speakers have. The other thing is they've now spent something on the order of a decade creating a defense in depth, war of attrition, internal structure which reorganizes the regular army and reorganizes the other parts of the Republican Guards. I'm not quite sure how well American precision strikes would be able to do without engaging at a truly massive level. And we're talking something closer to 90 to 100 days than we are a week or two. Clearing the Gulf is one thing, but if you're going to use the term war, you have to define it. And if that war is to move to the point where you think you can get to regime change, and nobody's mentioned that at all today, you are really talking about a war of a very different character entirely. But it's also one that Mr. Bolton has on occasion mentioned. So sometimes simplifying helps. Other times it gets to be pretty dangerous. Very good comments. Uh, Link Bloomfield, you were next. Well, thanks very much. Great comments. I agree with you that military escalation does not advance any scenario that we should up with anything better. Um, so it sort of begs the question, what do we want? And you framed the point quite well that it's unclear what we want. We're in a very unusual circumstance, as I won't repeat what you've said. But if you did know what you wanted in terms of a scenario, a set of conditions, a, a state of play, the next question, which I think is much harder, is why? Why do we want it? Because that gets to something I haven't heard, and I'm not talking about two experts who've come out of the intelligence community, but the policy architects no longer talk about the American interests or what do we stand for in the world. Because, because it's sort of covered by the politics of the incumbent administration and the people opposed to them. It's always about that. And the mistakes or the decisions they've made and the sort of angst that that has generated. If one were back in the Cold War looking at, say, uh, the Soviet threat to the Fulda Gap and the nuclear standoff and the third party sort of proxy contests, all of that would be the subject of intense policy speculation as to what do we stand for, where do we take a stand, what should we talk about, where are the, where are the vulnerabilities on the other side to get to some state that we care about. And I, I guess I'm just pointing out that in the absence of that, it seems to be okay. Well, President Trump has actually validated the initial thought of President Obama, which is if they don't have nuclear weapons, I'm fine which means I'm fine, let's start with Bashar al-Assad, the 11 million people driven from their homes. Eh. The State Department, which came out this week and put Iran in tier three, that's children being taken from their homes. Maybe that's just not an American concern anymore. Um, and, and, and there's a list and I'll stop here, but the point is, is there not an American interest? Are there not American principles? Freedom of navigation, the Carter Doctrine, something. 
So I just I invite you to sort of criticize the policy arena. It's not your main event, but talk about U.S. interests and policy. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. I think that's an important dimension that too often gets forgotten in you know, questions of how do we pursue the Iran obsession. Um, one thing I didn't have time to elaborate on when I suggested some, some of the you know, requirements for getting out of the, the current impasse uh, when I talked about third party mediation and so on. Another one is to start asking not only your question, but a couple of questions that come before that. Um, everyone's in favor of uh, we want to have less, uh, uh, you know what the catchwords are, the mantras. That does not by itself translate very well into you know, negotiable issues that through negotiation or any other means can advance U.S. interests. Once you get down to the specifics, you have to ask, first of all, what exactly is it that the Iranians are doing that we really want in that? Uh, how is what they're doing, what, what purpose does it serve for the Iranians, and what is the implication of that in terms of our, of our likelihood of ever getting them to change, or at least trying to divert them into some more destructive channel? How is whatever they're doing different, if at all, from what other regional actors are doing, and what does that imply in terms of our ability to get some kind of unilateral constraints on, on Iran that don't apply to the Saudis and to others? And finally, most important is exactly the question that you brought up, you know, what, what, is, what is the U.S. interest in all that? And it's too often forgotten. If I were putting together the, um, you know, doing the advance advance planning for whenever we finally get to have some negotiations on various things, you know, I would put near the top of my list uh, the unjustified detention of dual citizens. There is no justification whatsoever you know, for Iran to do that. It is something that directly affects U.S. interests, and I would be a real hardliner on that. Um, when you get to other things that are more issues of regional rivalries, in which the question is, where the, do the U.S. interests lie in tilting toward this side or that side? Well, then, then we've got a much bigger debate. But, but I commend you for bringing that up because the whole question of, in the end, what are we aiming for, um, is too often forgotten. Ken, you want to say? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer it perhaps in a slightly different way, which is to say that I think we're actually having that conversation a lot. The problem is that this administration isn't participating. Um, and sure. my great fear is that we're going to wind up in a really bad place once this administration finally passes, whenever that is, uh, to actually restart the debate. Right? Particularly, we're talking about. Much wrong. We're talking about the Middle East and what are American interests in the Middle East. And effectively, since about 2000, we've been having a debate about that and about how important it is and what the U.S. should be trying to do in the region. Um, and I would actually argue that you know, under Obama, in many ways, you know, that debate came to a head, at least in certain quarters. Um, you can like Obama's Middle East policy, you can hate it, but he had a very clear set of ideas about what he thought the value of the Middle East was to the United States, where our interests lay, how to pursue it, right? And that generated a lot of debate with people arguing both for and against. And from my perspective, that's unresolved. Going into the Trump administration, that was unresolved. Now, a few things. First, Obama's debate started to get taken over by the polarization, because everything in Washington gets taken over by the polarization. And so even though there was a strategic argument about the relative value of the Middle East and how to pursue America's interests there, and that was going on you know, among certain people in the Middle East community, some of them in this very room, right? it was being drowned out by the partisanship, right? which was utterly uninterested in strategy, just wanted to score points against the other. And even when one side was doing something that was more or less in accord with the strategy they were pushing, they couldn't possibly embrace it because it was the other side doing it, right? So that issue is, is absolutely there. With Trump, obviously, that's even worse. But the bigger issue, I think, goes to a point that Paul made beforehand, which I completely agree with, which is this administration literally doesn't have a Middle East policy, right? I hate saying that, 
right? You hear that, I've been hearing that, I've been in Washington for 32 years, I have been hearing it in Washington for 32 years with people saying the administration doesn't have, even have a strategy for X. Well, 99.999% of the time, they do have a policy, the speaker simply doesn't like it, right? And they're claiming that it's incoherent, therefore it isn't policy. In the case of Trump, it's literally true, right? You know, we all have friends in government, some in very high places. They've been trying to get this administration to put in place what a coherent strategy for the region is. They have no traction because the president isn't interested. I think Paul is absolutely right. Iran was driven by the president's decision on the campaign trail to make a big deal about the JCPOA, which he described as the worst deal ever. I don't think he understood a blessed thing about it when he called it that, right? But he is stuck to that position. Right? And you know, he has gotten us into this situation. And that, too, is obscuring the wider policy debate. Right? And you know, to me, one of the fascinating things right now is how both left and right are reacting to what he has done over the last few days, right? where you know, you've got folks on the left kind of happy that Trump didn't hit Iran because that accords with their strategic vision. And you've got folks like Tom Cotton saying, this is insane. We cannot let the Iranians get away with it. And frankly, I'm in agreement with both of them. Right? And to me, what is most problematic is that Trump has managed to put us in a position where we've got both of those things running at cross purposes. Right? And again, you can only get there by not having any strategic vision whatsoever. Last point, as I said, I don't know when we're gonna get rid of this administration, but whenever it happens, I do hope that we come back to this debate over the, the Middle East and its role in our interests and what a good strategy moving forward would be as we come out of the era of American primacy. I fear, though, that we will be so bollocked up by what this administration does and so hyper polarized. We're not going to be able to have that conversation next time around. Thank you very much. Now we've got about 20 minutes left. I've got about six people on my list and I will not open it up any further. And here we go. Um, Andrew Steinfeld, former Foreign Service. Um, to pick up on what you said, uh, Ken, and what you said, Paul, um, I've been con I did a lot of work with three years in Israel, a lot of work with the Gulf. Um, I'm convinced that a lot of what's going on has little to do with the nuclear deal and it has a lot to do with the struggle for hegemony on either side of the Gulf. And my question is, um, let's posit we have a new administration and let's posit we have, like picking off on, for example, Obama's famous Atlantic interview where he talked about some balance in US policy on both sides of the Gulf, which totally infuriated uh, Abu Dhabi and Riyadh. Um, by the way, if I were uh, Abu Dhabi and Riyadh in Jerusalem, I would be a little nervous about the Democrats coming back to power. Um, but my question is, if we had a real Secretary of State and real diplomacy, and not an evangelical bully, pardon my phrase, um, running U.S. diplomacy, given NBC and MBS and Khamenei, neither of the three seem to be going anywhere. Is any sort of creative, dynamic American diplomacy, a la Kissinger or Baker, of saying, we're in charge. You need us more than we need you. And putting them around the table and saying, you know, you've wreaked too much havoc in the Middle East and the world. Now you're going to listen to the United States. And we're going to figure out a way to deal with both sides of the Persian Gulf. Uh, is, is, that, is that completely naive at this point? In which case, perhaps war is inevitable. It is One not, of you answered this. It is not at all naive, and I think you're quite right to take a page from Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon and their triangular diplomacy, which involved the Soviets and the Chinese. By so unreservedly taking one side of a great divide in the Middle East, on the southern side of the Persian Gulf or on the north side, it has not only um, you know, reduced the chance for accommodation and compromise and advancing both of our interests through negotiation, whether it's on nuclear matters or anything else, with the side that we see as the adversary. It has given 
you know, MBZ and MBS um, and others that we consider on our side, carte blanche to do things without fear that they're going to lose this unqualified U.S. support. So I think triangular diplomacy of a new sort, uh, in which we do deal with the Iranians, while making it clear we're going to continue to be, continue to be uh, very constructive partners with the likes of the UAE and Saudi Arabia. But MBZ and MBS, you don't have a blank check anymore. Um, we're dealing with everyone, and you got to realize that in shaping your policies. And if if that part of what you realize is you need more of a detente in this part of the world, um, because that's what we'd like to see, then uh, that's, that's the direction you ought to go. Well, that's your point. Do you need a new Secretary of State for that? Right? I, I'm going to slightly disagree with Paul on that one. Um, first, I don't think that it's like this or not under this administration, because that's just not how they conceive of this. Right. I'll also say that, you know, I would put American policy toward the region slightly different. I don't think when I think of subcontracting, to me, that means we're more or less allowing them to lead the way and following behind them, which I don't want to do. That's not how I see it all. I think we've just defaulted. Right? I don't think this president cares. I think that he does more or less allow them to do what they want to do. But when I speak to Emiratis and Saudis, which is on a fairly regular basis, what I hear from them is, and Israelis as well, incredible frustration with Trump. Right? That they understand that they don't have the capacity they were expecting the United States to lead, and they have been unbelievably frustrated that we keep saying that we're going to, and we do nothing. Right? So could you put such a coalition together? Could you get negotiations going? Yeah, I think that you would, but I think that the really critical point is the first one that you made, which is that the United States would actually have to step in and say, okay, we're in charge and we're going to order the region, right? And here's how it's going to work. And MBS and MBZ, you're going to get this and not that, right? And Iran, you're going to get this and not you that. You think they'd be open to that, MBZ and MBS? No, I think they wouldn't. I think they want their cake and eat it, too. Yeah. But the point is, they're not, is, from their perspective, you know, they're not getting anything, yeah. right? And yes, it's nice to have freedom, but what they really want is American support. I mean, Again, I know the Saudis and MRIs have been just as frustrated as everyone around this table, perhaps for slightly different reasons over the last few weeks, right? They're the ones getting hit. They met at Mecca. They called on the United States to take a lead in doing something about this. And Trump's response was, not my problem. Okay, uh, let, let me just go through this. I've got four people, Marge Sonnenfeld, Dawn McManus, George Beebe, and Wayne Merritt. So they're the four. You're up. Thanks very much to both presenters and to the many interesting comments and questions. My first two questions have been pretty well covered, so I'll go to level level three. Uh, I read only a fraction of even the public press, and of course have no access to inside. But since the waivers were threatened and then issued, I see very little, uh, maybe I've missed it, um, complaint comment from some of our, uh, some of the other signatories to the uh, JCPOA and some of the large countries who could perhaps be helpful in this situation. And uh, could we put that, no, I, I didn't mean the Europeans. I'm thinking of Japan and China, the big oil buyers. Well, they're, they're in this uh, pinch, especially for Japan, of, of having to um, uh, walk a fine line between maintaining their relationship with the United States and, and you know, meeting their economic and energy needs, as well as their relationships with, with China and, uh, and more oil suppliers. So um, th there's no question that Abe's you know, most recent visit to Iran was a huge disappointment for him. You had this you know, additional embarrassment. You know, the, the background of which still hasn't been figured out in, ter in terms of a Japanese tanker being one of the um, tankers that was hit on the very well, day that there. he was meeting yes. with the supreme yes. leader. Um, and I, I think that might um, support uh, John Vio's uh, uh, suggestion that you know, the Red Guard is, has an has a, uh, incentive to do uh, disruptive things, uh, even if the other higher-ups in, politically in Tehran don't. But, um, I, I think it's if, if there hasn't been more squawking, it's more because they've got other interests, particularly having to do with keeping relations with Washington on an even keel. Uh, Doyle, you're next. 
Paul made a, a manful and creative attempt to, to construct an off-ramp for President Trump in terms of a new agreement and negotiations with a, a third party. I'd like, I'd like you to uh, imagine, the, put the question this way, if, if you were advising any of the Democratic candidates who so far haven't said much beyond we should avoid getting into dumb wars and we should rejoin the JCPOA, uh, what would you advise them to be saying? And should they explicitly or implicitly be sending a message to Iran to go ahead and hang on and try and wait the guy out? Either of you want to take that one on? Yeah. Um, for, for the candidates, as, as you mentioned, Doyle, already, several already have said I would rejoin the JCPOA. They ought to quickly couple that with, and that is you know, the diplomatic entree to using diplomacy to address all the other issues we have with Iran, security-related issues or whatever. Uh, and the only way we have hope of getting effective resolution of those issues through peaceful measures is to restore our credibility in the first instance with something like the JCPOA. So I, I, if I were the candidate, I'd make it clear, yeah, JCPOA, that's fine, but that's not the end of it. That's only the beginning of the story. And, and all these other issues, these problems we have with Iran, they are still very important. I just want to use peaceful diplomatic means of resolving them, not, uh, not military means. Okay, uh, uh, George. Thanks, uh, George Beebe, Center for the National Interest. Um, Dwight Eisenhower used to say, when you can't solve a problem, what you need to do is enlarge it. So I want to invite the panelists to engage in a little bit of creative thinking on how enlarging this problem might provide uh, a means to an off-ramp from the crisis that we have put ourselves in. Um, and I want to offer uh, a few examples of things that you might react to as well. Um, one way of, uh, of enlarging this might have something to do with something that you raised, Paul, with North Korea. Uh, are there things that we might be able to do vis-a-vis -vis North Korea in dealing with that problem that might actually make the Iranian problem a little less prickly than it is right now? Uh, second thing. Uh, Saudi Arabia, um, one of the things that's been going on in the news in parallel to what's happening with Iran is the Iranian nuclear uh, weapons question and the degree to which the United States might facilitate or not uh, Saudi Arabia acquiring a bomb. I'm in no way advocating that Saudi Arabia ought to have a nuclear weapon, but uh, is there a link between Iranian thinking about pursuing enrichment as a means of leveraging us and the Europeans and others, and that Saudi nuclear question. Uh, to what degree might that have an impact on Iranian thinking on their way forward? And the third thing is um, here in the United States, we had a, a JCPOA. It was an executive agreement. It was explicitly designed not to be a treaty subject to Senate ratification because, in part, the Obama administration felt that it might have a very difficult time getting ratification. But this, I would uh, suggest, is something that might affect Iranian thinking about the durability of U.S. promises. If the Trump administration were to say, for example, uh, not only do we need a better agreement, but we need one that we can submit to the Senate and get ratif ratification, and in so doing, show the durability of the U.S. commitment, would that have any kind of effect on Iranian thinking? Okay. Thanks. Both of you, very quickly. I'll start with your, uh, well, with a couple of pieces of, of what you threw out there, George. Uh, so first, uh, enlarging the issue, I actually think the best way to enlarge the issue goes to what Andrew's point, which is, I think the right way to have handled this would have been to try to form a security architecture for the Persian Gulf, something I've been on about for 15, 20 years, right, where this issue gets folded in with a whole host of other issues that can then be reconciled across them, right, rather than just say we're going to pick this one out and try to solve that, which is very hard to do. There are all kinds of cross claims. Iran has its legitimate concerns as well. That's the better way to do it. Uh, with regard to the Saudi nuclear program, again, none of us knows because we don't, we're not privy to these debates, but I would be exceptionally surprised if the Saudi nuclear program isn't a critical element 
of Iran's decisions about whether or not to continue moving forward. I think that if they see the United States enabling Saudi Arabia to develop a nuclear, what could eventually become a nuclear weapons program, then yes, I think that that will give a great deal of impetus behind what they're ultimately planning to do. I, I would just uh, answer by saying, in general, enlarging would help. I mentioned, but certainly regionally, in Iranian eyes, the less that they are singled out for what the Iranians consider to be exceptional and exceptionally restricted treatment, while their regional rivals are not, uh, the more we can get away from that, uh, the more likely we, are, we can achieve agreements with them. And this would be true not just on the nuclear matters involving Saudi Arabia, but for example, missiles, which keeps coming up. Um, and you know, the Iranians who were on the receiving end of the War of the Cities bombardment from uh, Iraq, and who see missile forces that some of their regional rivals have, they see what the Saudis did you know, years ago with the CSS-2s from China, and they see manned air forces that are vastly superior to those. I mean, just take the UAE's air force, it would be, it's way above you know, what uh, the decrepit uh, uh, air force that Iran has. If we had a regional approach to missiles, with things like range limitations and so on, I think you'd get a much more constructive response from Iran than you're getting right now. Wayne, you have the last word. Embarrassing. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Follow up a little bit on from what George had introduced. When the JCPOA was signed by the Obama administration, not only couldn't it get ratification on the Hill, it didn't get bugger all support <coughs> on the Hill from either party and either house. Uh, and I have heard very little from the Democratic side uh, critical of Trump policy that would actually mean an engagement policy of some kind with Iran. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to touch that with a 10-foot pole. And if I were advising the Iranian government on the future of American politics, I think I'd say, look, your problem is at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, and it's more broadly uh, that the American public have uh, been led to demonize your country even more perhaps than Russia. And so whatever happens in the next election, you're still in the same situation. And that perhaps the best advice you've been given is from Vladimir Putin, based on his not inconsiderable personal experience, where he basically was sort of paraphrasing Bismarck and saying, look, the Americans can do whatever they want, no matter how stupid, no matter how culpable, they walk away from it. You are the one who gets hurt. And my question is, show me a scenario here. We don't have a shooting war. We don't, God forbid, have boots on the ground. We don't have anything that would produce regime change. But show me a scenario in the next few years in which Iran can reasonably expect to come out better off, just better off, not you know be accepted in the global community. But if I was in Tehran looking at this, I'd basically say, I, we are isolated. There's nothing much we can do about it except change our own regime, which we're not going to do. So what's in it for us to accommodate not just the Americans, what's in it for us to accommodate almost anybody? Two brief answers, please. Thank you. Well, if they were abiding by the JCPOA obligations, they would have uh, economic relief that would certainly leave them better off. Um, and that's that's at near the top of the list. With our sanctions in place? Uh, maybe I misunderstood your question. No, no, no. Uh, what I'm saying is we, our policies maintain. Oh. Well, then I didn't. Let me, I, I don't understand your question. Let me, let me have Ken. Ken, do you? Yeah, I thought it was the same thing. Um, <laughs> show, uh, show me a Democrat who's willing to engage Iran, really engage Iran. Oh, sure. Yeah. Barack Obama. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, let's not lose sight of that way. And look, you know, again, I think I've been quite critical of the Trump administration. I think they deserve it, right? They've put us into this awful situation. All that said, you know, I have my own problems with Iran stemming both from my own efforts under Clinton to try to reconcile with them, but also under Obama, right? I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. Obama wanted desperately to have a rapprochement with Iran. Kerry wanted it even more. Right? They will never have another American president 
that would be more accommodating of their interests than Barack Obama. They spurned him. Right? Iran has managed to alienate every single one of its neighbors. Right? They are hated. I was just I spent another week in Baghdad last week. Right? They are completely under Iran's thumb, and they detest the Iranians. Right? So there's no question about it that they make a lot of problems for themselves. Right? And there's no question about it that the hardliners who benefit from that are probably making hay. But we also have to recognize, and again, this is one of the things I hate about Trump, is that he has put us in the situation where we are the problem, right? Where Iran no longer is. His, his policy has been so ham-fisted, right, that everyone looking around the world is saying, it's hard for us to blame the Iranians, it's easy for us to blame the Americans, right? That's the real problem. It's one of the reasons why I remain silent when Paul tried gamely to answer how does Trump turn this around? Because truthfully, my answer is we build a time machine we go back to 2017, and we don't do any of this stuff. Well, on that very, very encouraging <laughs> and cheerful note, thank you all for an excellent, uh, lively discussion that I'm certain we will return to.